So hello, this is wonderful. I'm going to let Paige do the introductions. Um, Dr. Rawson, sorry, Dr. Rawson. I was wondering, you know, it's okay. You're, I think it's all right for you to call me Paige. I, I feel pretty comfortable. Okay, you can call me Kathy. So oh, can know. I? Just call me Kathy. And uh, Edwin here, of course. Yeah, oh, Edwin, absolutely, absolutely. So, so excited uh, to be back here, continuing our Ethics and World Religion series uh, with a conversation with Dr. Edwin Fagley, actually. So Dr. Wright and I are here. Uh, just wanted to, to hang out with Dr. Bagley and uh, to pick your brain because you, you know kind of a lot of stuff, uh, specifically about world religion. And so we're excited to have you. Welcome, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Tell us a little bit, if you could, about yourself. What got you into the study of religion, uh, world religions and ethics? I, I mean, how did you find yourself here in this place, having been a professor of world religions for how many years? Oh, uh, God, I don't know, 40 or so. So, uh, yeah, so, so what happened was I grew up in Alabama at Baptist and went to a Baptist college and went to a Baptist seminary thinking about the ministry, but in college I discovered philosophy and it drew me away from that. But I went on to seminary anyway because my, my teacher told me, you know, if you want to teach in a Baptist college, a seminary degree is a good thing to have. Absolutely. So, so I did that. And, uh, and then while I was there taking philosophy of history courses from Eric Rust, uh, I got interested in the 19th century German philosophy, where they spent a lot of time speculating about how cultures and specifically religions got started in different parts of the world. And were there things about human nature or human society that led them to develop the way they did? And I just got really interested in that. And the guys in the 19th century didn't know nearly as much about, say, Hinduism and Buddhism as we do mm -hmm. now. And so they said some funny things, but it, it kind of piqued my you know, interest and I got started. Um, and so I spent several years focusing on ma mainly 19th century German philosophy. And, and then, um, then while I was at Wingate in the early years, I had an opportunity to go and spend six weeks in India one summer studying religious mm -hmm. art. And mm -hmm. that was what really kicked me over the edge there. So we, uh, we, we, had, we had a week of lectures uh, at the University of Madras. And uh, we had a, a, a different fellow from each of the, maybe we had two weeks of lectures. We were there for quite a while. It's, it's a beautiful city right on the ocean, southeastern India. And uh, it was called a philosophy department, but there was uh, a, a Hindu, a Jain, a Buddhist, a Muslim, and each of them came in and taught us about their tradition and so on. So philosophy there was sort of like history of religions is here. And, and then we spent several weeks traveling all around India, going in temples and going to some of the old sculpture schools and going in museums. And it's just, it's just an incredible, uh, rich experience to do that. Uh, we crisscrossed the country back and forth all over and, and, uh, oh, cool. and got to spend a lot of time amongst just ordinary people as well. And that was, uh, it really seared itself into my memory and made me even more interested in how these religions develop how they originate, how they develop, and so on. So that, but that that put me into the business of, of thinking about uh, the uh, not only the origins, but the different things that influence religious development along the way, yeah, and, and how and art figure and how art figures in. You know, what, what the visual side. You know, absolutely. So. Well, and also, I mean, the thing that I'm hearing too is is how interwoven, right? These ideas of what we think religion is, but also philosophy and culture, right? I mean, you can't mm -hmm. really untangle these things uh right, and so right. you were there studying religion but it was these philosophical traditions that are also to us considered religions but it's really about the way we think the way we act the way we live in the world right the way we create right yeah, uh, yeah, you're talking yeah. about art very exciting yeah. so you so you shifted then from ministry into teaching which is another i would say form of ministry too right i mean it's it's pretty wonderful to be able to bring this kind of information and to enlighten students who maybe haven't had the opportunity to hear about Hinduism or Buddhism or, right? So that's what we're here doing today. Yeah, well, what you probably don't know is that for uh, my first 25 years or so at Wingate, until I was about 65, uh, I also did interim pastorates in Baptist churches around. So I had uh, kind of ministry going on the side, preaching a couple of times or sometimes three times a week, you know, and visiting the sick and doing all that kind of stuff in the churches. Yeah. So I was, I was back and forth between the two. I, th I think that the funny thing was some of my lectures began to sound like sermons and some of my sermons began to sound like lectures and it was, it was hard <laughs> to sort them out. <laughs> At least that's what people would tell me. But it, 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 was, uh, it was a rich learning experience for me. And I think uh, something good that those of us at the university were able to do for churches in the area too. 
Yeah, yeah, cool. Kathy, you want to roll in with the next question? Ooh, I was a, so today we're talking about Hinduism. So this idea of Hinduism, can you give us some experiences? So you told us a little bit that you went to India and you were learning kind of the history of religions. Can you speak at all to your experiences there with Hinduism or of through the you know, few years that you were teaching at Winget, specifically with Hinduism, any personal encounters that you, with people, with art, with um, you know, different, um, different ways of experiencing Hinduism specifically? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, yeah, I like the Marie Height book that we've been using in the ethics course. I think it's, a, it's basically an accurate book, although books like that are necessarily very brief. And so one of the things that's hard to pick out when you use brief textbooks is to realize the diversity within Hinduism. Uh, some people say it's best understood as a sort of a family of religions with common backgrounds because there are so many different gods and goddesses. Uh, so many different traditions, uh, different styles of worship, and, and going around the country day by day, you know, we would see the great diversity there. Uh, and so th there are gods that we would see in the artwork in the temples that are rarely worshipped anymore at all. Brahma, the great creator god, is, only shows up occasionally, and, and he's, he's, he's very easy to see. He's, he's usually on the top of the temple with four faces, one facing in each direction, you know, how would you like to say that? You know, that's their artistic way of, of speaking, of being able to see all things and know all things. Uh, uh, in the same way that God's having multiple arms is a way of saying they're stronger, more powerful than we are. <laughs> the, the way they, they, uh, they, they could use the art in, in a nation where they were not able to use, you know, a common language. There were so many different languages all over India. Um, so the, the two, the, the two gods we ran into the most of all were, were Shiva and Vishnu. Uh, I brought home a Shiva. I'll turn the camera around and we'll see him for just a minute. So because this kind of helps us think about, um, this was my 40 some odd pound carry on luggage coming back from India. You got that on the uh, plane? Well, yeah, wrapped in brown paper with string. That was <laughs> back in the old days when they didn't Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think that would fly anymore. <laughs> Well, it's Literally, flying. it wouldn't fly. Okay, sorry, I just thought <laughs> you like that. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful statue. Uh, the, the art specialist in Charlotte told me it needed a bit more of a smile right here, but the rest of it's pretty good. And he said at the time, it was probably the biggest one in the Charlotte area. Uh, you probably can't tell. It's about two feet tall here. So this is Shiva, uh, the Lord of the Dance, and Nataraj. And I would take this to class. And... Uh, and one of the first, I would set it there, and after a few minutes, somebody would say, Dr. Bagley, why is that woman standing on a baby? Which was a good discussion starter, <laughs> because it's, it's a male figure, and it's not a baby, it's a demon. It's the demon of ignorance and disorder down there, and Shiva is dancing to create the world. He picked up some of the creation stories from, from old Brahma, and you've got the fires of creation around the ring. Uh, you've got a little bit of fire here in his left hand. A little drum up here in his right hand as he dances, uh, and he's dancing and spinning as he creates the world. It's, it's supposed to be great fun. You can even see the hair uh, circling out around him as he spins up there. And this, this is a, a fairly accurate, uh, uh, you know, very similar to a lot of the others that you would see. Uh, there's a little picture of Ganga up here, the uh, goddess who represents the Ganges River. Because at one point, the story was that when the gods unloosed the river for it to come down through India, it was coming so fast, it was going to wash everybody away. So Shiva came down and put his hair in the way and let it slow it. And so uh, let the Ganga or the Ganges be a great gift. Uh, cobra over here, so you'll know not to be afraid of danger. Shiva can handle it all. Uh, and, you know, those are, the, those are the little kinds of things. Some of the mudras or, or hand gestures have different meanings. Uh, but we would see this in, in many of the temples. Uh, people would go in to the temples, uh, very often uh, do the namaste there, uh, burn some incense, sometimes circumambulate the, the altar on which the god stood. Uh, there would often be other goddesses, uh, other gods and goddesses around. Parvati was his most familiar consort. She's in the stories and in, in many of the temples as well. Um, and of some interest, I guess, is, is what's called the Shiva Lingam. In some of the temples, the central thing is not an image of Shiva, but a, a sort of a, a column. 
uh, which generally in the West we think of as a sort of a phallic symbol, but in India, some people, when that was mentioned, took offense at that. And they said, oh, no, no, it's just a, an abstract sort of uh, a representation of Shiva himself. Uh, but it would be in the center, and uh, we were not allowed officially to go in, but occasionally some liberal priest would sneak us in and let us look around, you know, and, and, and uh, see the, the images of the gods and as well as the lingam. Uh, Vishnu temples were a little more closely held. We didn't get into those typically. We had to peek in the windows and the doors. It's, you know, you're only supposed to go in if you're one of the true believers, and uh, there, there are a lot of religions like that. But those are the two big ones. Uh, Shiva, the destroyer, who will destroy anybody who threatens his faithful followers. And Vishnu, the preserver, who will preserve his faithful followers. So they sort of do the same things, but they've got these different characterizations. And, and occasionally you'll see a picture of Kali, a very dark-skinned goddess who's similar to Shiva in many ways, a little meaner looking, and has big teeth and blood and a necklace of skulls. <laughs> and, but she will protect her followers too. And some of those very fierce depictions of hers we, we found on the outskirts of villages, just to let people know that we are faithful to her and she will be faithful to us. You know? So, so, uh, so I, I, I think that, that diversity of, of traditions uh, is, is one of the most interesting things. Somewhere I have a, a Ganesha, the elephant-headed god. There are several stories about how he got to be that way. Uh, no one cancels out the rest, but Anyway, he is, people would say, everybody's darling. If you had something new coming up today, maybe you had a big test in your ethics class, or you're going to propose marriage, or apply for a job, or do something like that, then you go by and offer Ganesha a little, a little offering, and maybe it'll help you out, you know, and uh, deals with new encounters. So that's, that's the first visual part of religion, that great diversity uh, of temples. And mostly we were welcomed and people were glad to see us. And a lot of the temples have schools. And so we'd see bunches of little kids, especially little boys, uh, walking along, saying the prayers together and so on. So a considerable amount of hospitality then it sounds like. I mean, you were for the most right. part welcomed in when you were, when there were Very spaces much. that were not private. You, they, they, and even sometimes, you know, you were able to be snuck in um, mm. to, to be able to experience. So, so hospitality, a big thing then there. Oh. Let me ask you this. Would you say, and this might, there might be some resonance then with the hate book here, but uh, some of the norms, guidelines, commands, principles, uh, what would you say are, are some of the kind of worldviews that are embedded in Hinduism? Okay. Well, the first one, you know, I did I mean, not, not, a, not a huge ago. question here, Edwin. You know, we're just throwing oh, you no, something no, really. No. <laughs> that, that, no, that's, that's a very important question. So occasionally, occasionally when you're greeting someone in, in yes. a Hindu or Buddhist nation, you do the namaste. Yes, which you the, mentioned. Could tell praying us. hand structures. Now yes. that, that really captures a big difference between Western and Asian religions, uh, especially the, the Indian-based religions, even though they've spread around Asia. So it, it's sort of a way of saying, I recognize the divine in you. Now, for all the fact that we say on this side of the world that people are created in the image of God, uh, for a great many Christians and others, you get the fall, which kind of knocks it out. Um, but in, on that part, I mean, the, big, the biggest single difference, I think, between the Indian-based religions and the Western religions, the, the Jewish, Christian, Muslim tradition, is that in India, God is somehow within you. And that's where you look to find God, uh, within me, within you, hidden sometimes by bad habits or false ideas or or the absence of good religious discipline or good mental discipline. And on this side of the world, we've all heard it, uh, is that we are basically sinners and God is radically others far apart, a great gap between us and God. And so the business of life is to overcome that gap. And that's very different from saying the business of life is to find God somehow within you. And that affects the way you regard other people, the way you treat them, uh, and, and the way you think about yourself. But I think the biggest difference between the two kind of Western, Eastern, if we can use that overly simplistic division. No, I think that's absolutely so powerful. I mean, I was actually going to ask you if you, if you thought there were any sort of parallels or um, discordant, the discordance between uh, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, right? So these more Abrahamic faith traditions too, and how we're living those in, in the United States. But it's interesting though, 
now having seen more influences from, if we're going to use the dichotomy, right, from Eastern uh, religious traditions or philosophical traditions now in the United States, because you're seeing more, uh, I think, more of an acceptance of these kind of notions, even within Christianity. Um, and this isn't, I don't necessarily have a, a question here as much as just something that I've noticed over the past, probably since the 60s and 70s, really, um, there's been a shift. Uh, anyhow, any, did you, did you want to say anything to that? Because you're a minister as well, right? So I'm certain that some of these ideas, maybe I should uh, assume, but I would imagine <laughs> that they've influenced, you know, because they've influenced me as a pastor, right? But I would imagine they've influenced how you teach or think about being a Christian. My first job in Texas, I went to class one day and somebody had gone around and put a brochure on every desk and the title on the front was God Hates You. And it was part of that old tradition that uh, we are absolutely worthless beings. We have no merit, no goodness within us. And so we have to go through that the whole grace. process. Sinners yeah. saved by grace. Yep. Right, right. And, and, uh, that's, and I thought that that's a kind of an extreme version, right. a, a Protestant version more than a Catholic version. I, I think one difference is that uh, the Catholic theologians who speak of the fall don't really think it cracked everything out of us. You know, it just kind of yeah. diminished our abilities, and we can gradually build those back through the right kinds of practices. Protestants think you're, you know, just, you got nothing worthwhile in you, so you may, you've got to find some way to uh, to make God happy. My with dad you. and I still talk about that to this day. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, I, but but I think you know, in a related way, uh, one of the other big things, and I did say Indian rather than Asian, because I think, you know, if we talk about uh, Confucianism or Taoism, they don't have quite the same view about human nature. Uh, but the Indian religions, the Hinduism and Jainism, and then Buddhism, which sprang up there and then spread, have tended to keep that notion that, that the real seed of goodness is somewhere within us to be found, to be uncovered, to be developed, you know, and so on. So, but then you've got this very, very strange thing in India. Uh, which is the caste system. Now, again, our book gives us the usual simple, you know, forecasts and an outcast. Uh, and, and, and that's, it turns out, way too simple because there are just thousands of subcasts. So much so that the terms we use don't always take account of a situation in which you find yourself. But the, the social differences there are obvious. And, and what's kind of interesting is, you know, in this country, we struggle with our caste systems and our, our problems of racism and so on, and they do too. And there are some interesting parallels. They, they tried to make the caste system illegal when they came in with a new con uh, uh, constitution in the late 1940s, but it didn't work because in order to help the people who had been discriminated against, they had to list scheduled castes and provide extra education or extra help for them. And so <laughs> it's, kind of, it's hard to it's hard to be an anti-caste or anti-racist, as we might say nowadays with, with uh, Cindy's book, uh, to, to, uh, to, to deal with the caste system. But it is, I think, perhaps among evil things that religions do, uh, a real problem. Because the, the word, the primary word for caste uses the word color. And it has been through the years a religiously sanctioned way to discriminate against darker skinned people. And it's so much at the heart of religion uh, that it's, it's even more difficult to deal with than some of the things we have on this side of the world, and at least theoretically and theologically. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a way to, to try to convince young people not to marry someone from a different caste, uh, keep them kind of closer to the, the home, the family, the village, the, the particular subcast of which people are a part. Um, and of course, we know the, the, the good sides of, of staying home and staying part of the community all your life. There are, there's, there are rich things to come out of that. And if, and if you have a community where you determine things for yourself rather than expecting somebody else to do it, there, you know, there's a Houston Smith used to say that was the positive side of the caste system. Uh, namely, the, the, they were sort of self-governing. Uh, the people from one caste didn't tell people in the other caste how to arrange their internal relationships. Um, but the downside of it is all of the terrible discrimination that takes place there for, for education, jobs, and, and other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember one day we, we had a, a young man who was a Buddhist guide. He was, uh, he was taking us through the deer park on the outskirts of Varanasi where Buddha sort of got his first con uh, converts. And um, 
and he explained to us about his life. He was, uh, he was a member of the Brahmin class. His wife was a member of the Kshatriya class. In fact, his name was Ashok, uh, the great fourth century emperor of, of India. Uh, and and uh, they fell in love, they wanted to get married, and both families objected because they had those built-in caste restrictions. And so they both converted to Buddhism because one of the things, Buddhism is much less strict with caste systems. Some of the Buddhists have kept some of it, but in theory, uh, Buddhism says those differences uh, should be done away with. That you should not have to, in their view, go through the castes from low caste to high caste and eventually work your way out of, out of rebirth uh, in, in the old Hindu system. That you should be able to do that in any particular life that you have. Yeah, wow. Um, it's interesting, I had, so I guess this is back in, maybe this was in 2016, there was um, a protest, the Dalit rose up. Do, do you remember this? And there was a protest, and so they were, they were storming the streets and they were protesting the caste system, right? So this is, these are the outcasts. Uh, and so there was this huge protest and it went on for, I don't even know how long. I mean, it was more than days, probably weeks. Um, but, but again, all in an appeal to be seen as human. Right, because there had been all of these abuses, human rights violations where Dalit were being beaten. And they can't and they can be because they do these menial, really disgusting tasks, uh, because they're seen as less than human. And but it's interesting what you're speaking to is it's actually one of our questions, in fact. Uh, and I don't Kathy, I, I, I don't want in any way to silence you because you might want to ask this question, but I think you're you're starting to speak to sort of the ethical dilemma within the religion itself, right? Um, that there are these beautiful aspects that are so life-giving and life-affirming, and yet simultaneously, like in every other religious tradition, there is a complexity, a paradox even, um, that, that, that makes it a little more difficult, right, um, to, to understand and, and Sometimes it makes us hard to really appreciate because it's easy for us to sit outside and sort of point at these things and say, well, that, that obviously doesn't work, right? Um, when, and I'm actually about to quote be this, but, um, <laughs> right? Uh, let you without saying Cassifer Stoner. Also, right, I mean, what about the, the plank in your eye? So anyhow, um, but, but uh, Kathy, do you want to go with the next question? Because you know I'm just going to keep talking now about ethical stuff. So what, <laughs> what do you want to do? I love talking about ethical stuff and learning. So I think the, before we turn to a, a concrete ethical situation, I know we're, we're, that's where we're going. Tell us a little bit more about the spiritual progress, because I think that's an important part, like karma and dharma. And, and because yeah. you, you mentioned like you get in your own way. How do you get out of your way for the spiritual progress? Because I think that's a, that's a key aspect that then informs your ethical deliberation and, and uh, moral reasoning. So if you wouldn't mind, yeah. and then we can get into- Sure, no. So, so a couple of those words that you run across early in the chapter in, in Marie Hyde's book, uh, Dharma and Karma are, are probably the place to start with that. Dharma meaning sort of duty of lifestyle. It's, it's, it's something you, you're born into. Uh, I, I think I think people all over the world will sometimes ask the question, especially if life's going badly, you know, why am I here in this place, in these times, maybe with these circumstances of my life? Um, if they're bad, you wonder, does God hate me? Is that why, why I'm, I'm, I'm being treated this way? It, it's especially stark on this side of the world when hardly anybody believes in reincarnation and a person comes into the world with some terrible uh, a negative aspect of their life, maybe some terrible physical malady or, or disability that's hard to deal with. Uh, they, they feel a little better about it on that side. It doesn't solve the whole thing. But over there, if you were born into terrible circumstances, you say, you know, I have no one to blame but myself because obviously this means in my previous life, I did not live well according to the Dharma of my caste, my family, my religion. That, that I was given by birth. And, and so theoretically, at least, the notion is that when you're born into a particular family and that suggests a lifestyle, a, maybe a career, uh, a, a, but certainly a religion as well, that if you will live well according to the standards in, 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 into which you have been born, which have been given to you by the circumstances of birth, then the next time you are reborn, uh, that you will be born in, in better circumstances. If you do badly, 
according to the rules of your family, you will be born in worse circumstances. Now that's kind of interesting because in this country, you ask somebody, do you know what karma is? And they say, oh yeah, well it goes around, comes around. You know, they think it's whatever you do today will make a difference in your life today. And, and that's not entirely absent from people with Indian based religion, but it's rare. Uh, for them, uh, karma affects your next rebirth not whether you get lucky or do well on the test or, or get lucky in the lottery or something like that. It's, uh, uh, you, you have a responsibility to live according to those rules. Uh, now that of course can, can still be, you know, fairly restrictive and um, people wonder why I should be stuck with these, why, you know, why should I be a, I don't know, a shoemaker or a sweeper or something just because I was born there. And, there's a little heavy handedness here. Remember at the top of the, uh, at the top of the heap for, for the, the, uh, the system of, of the different castes or the priests and they're telling us, you better live according to the rules of your caste. You know, get very preachy in that perspective. You, you don't be, don't try to be a priest. Don't try to be a warrior or a king or a business person. Stick with what you're born with and that's your responsibility. Um, occasionally you'll see somebody try especially in these modern times, to put the priests second and put the, uh, the rulers and the rich people at the top. You know, that's an effect of capitalism and globalization, I think. But mostly the priests are thought of it as, as being at the top. And that's the basis of their sermon. Live according to uh, the, the situation, the, the perspective into which you were born. Um, does that help? Oh, yes. And that's Is that what you were looking for? Segue. Absolutely, because the idea that within the height book, the relationship of karma and dharma is important to then understand the different, because um, I know on the, the Hindu values and principles, they talk about tolerance and honesty and self-control and respect and ahisma. Um, and uh, so I know the textbook gives, you, gives our students lots of ideas, but explaining the relationship, that's important. And now, like, how does this live out in the 21st century? So Paige, do you want to ask a, a little bit about a recent, you know, ethical dilemma? You always put it so nicely. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, no, uh, if, I, if I'm eloquent as much as I just like to talk, but um, I, so, you know, in, in previous videos, one of the things that we've gotten other scholars and practitioners to think about Edwin is a concrete, um response to a contemporary situation ethical dilemma right so for instance what would be a hindu response to uh black lives matter or a hindu response to the me too movement right um what would be a hindu response to i mean even just anything that we have been dealing with uh recently in contemporary in our contemporary political situation right uh so can you think of a Hindu response to, to one of the dilemmas that we're dealing with in 2020? I mean, even a Hindu response could be to COVID too. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm just curious what, what a Hindu response would look like in the face of these kind of uh, dilemmas. Um, again, the diversity of, of, of life across India is uh, so incredible. I mean, you go into a small village where most of the people cannot read or write, and they are so dependent on word of mouth or maybe a television down at the, the general store for, for whatever they know about the world. Uh, and then you go into the big city with all the, the tall buildings and the high tech computer uh, firms that are there. And there's, there are a lot of highly educated people in India. Uh, you know, many of the pe people getting PhDs in, in uh, engineering and math and so on in this country come from Asian countries and South Asian countries. And, and uh, the, the, the level of education for some people is, is very high. And then at the other end, there are of, of people who are, are very limited in what they can know. Um, so what kind of, I, I guess to say that is, when you follow the news, you see that uh, gender-based discrimination and race-based discrimination is still a big part of life in India. Uh, it's, it hasn't faded just because, uh, you know, just because this is the 21st century. Uh, I guess one place where it plays out is in India, as in several other countries, there's a great preference for male offspring. And so now that, um, you know, there was an emphasis for a while in India, like there has been in China, to limit the number of offspring. 
And whenever that happened, people didn't want a female for several reasons. One is she would marry and go take care of somebody else's parents. Uh, they might have to come up, not only that, but have to come up with the, some, some big gift, a wedding gift to the groom's family to, to take her off their hands, you know. And uh, they would much rather have a son who would bring a, a, a you know, wife into the family to help them when they get old. Um, and, and so the result of that was, as, as we've noticed, um, a, a change in the, the ratio of men and women. Uh, you know, selective abortions, ultrasounds are in vans now. They travel around the country and will do um, a, a, a ultrasounds and selective abortions to try to make sure that people can get male children rather than female. So you got a lot of unhappy bachelors. <laughs> and, and in countries as populous as India and China, uh, the numbers of them are just staggering. Men who will never marry. Uh, they are resentful. Uh, there often is a lot of sexual repression there. Uh, it comes out in some of the same kinds of stories there that you read in other parts of the world with uh, 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 rapes and, and various kinds of sexual assault. We don't read about that very much in our daily papers. But you know, if you start following Indian papers and Indian news reports, you'll see that it's, uh, it's fairly common there for that to happen. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing for them to deal with. A lot of people just think that, that as is the case in other parts of the world, <laughs> that the men should be in charge and the men should be able to do whatever they want. I don't think that's a, just a culturally based kind of thing. It's, it's everywhere in the world. So is there anything from the Hindu tradition that could speak to how you decide what is right and wrong in, in those situations that you were describing? Like what would someone <laughs> appeal to to not um, selectively abort? They could say, well, you're, you're, you're impacting here or you're doing this. Is, is there anything from the, the tradition, the faith tradition that could speak to some of these different issues that might change behavior? I know, I'm putting... yeah, I, think, I think Marie Height has it right. Um, the, 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 um, the situation of your birth is based on karma. And the, the divine system of justice makes sure that you're born in exactly the right place based on how you lived your previous lives and the kind of good karma or bad karma you accumulated. Uh, and and it, uh, it comes out you know, ex expressed in that particular way. So what if you do something to interrupt that process? Uh, in this part of the world, people who are opposed to abortion are opposed to abortion because they think of it as murdering a human being and that murder is wrong no matter the age of the human being. Uh, over there, the, the more obvious perspective is that you have gone against the will of the gods by interrupting the path from, from conception to birth to having a particular life that the gods have planned. And so you're opposing the will of the gods. Uh, when, you, when you go to a funeral there and they're burning a body, there, there comes the point at some point when, uh, when the, the body is washed and laid out on the pile of wood and burned and the family is often still nearby. And at some point, sometimes the skull will pop. And that's a joyous moment because that's the moment when the soul has gotten away and it has gone more or less immediately into a womb somewhere as part of the divine function of karma in reincarnation. Uh, the, the gods are doling that out according to just standards. If you interrupt that, you've opposed the will of the gods. So, so that is the primary thing you have done wrong there in their thinking. So I, th I think it's a significant difference. Thank you. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm learning so much and it's awesome. so great to be chatting with you. Um, <laughs> and I know we have a part two video and, and conversation uh, that's coming up soon. Okay, well, let me say one more thing because you, oh, yeah. you, you mentioned ahimsa there, uh, the, the mm -hmm. nonviolence. Uh, ahimsa meaning, you know, not, not harming other people. If you have a chance to, to talk to Jim Hastings, who spent several years in India studying the Jains, he points out that the Hindus, Gandhi and some others, got that pretty much from the Jains, that the Mahavira, the, the primary founding figure of, of Jainism, was the most nonviolent person you could imagine, just extreme and, and uh, the sort of thing we, we, we chuckle about when we see the stories about how he would sweep before his path and how Jane's would not drink out of a stream without straining it through a, a cloth to make sure they didn't kill any tiny little organisms there. You know? <laughs> and, and yet it was, we came to know that because of Gandhi. 
yeah. who on, on several points in the 20th century became a primary moral figure. Now, what, what you discover in India is a lot of people in India think Gandhi was a little weird, kind of offbeat, but extreme. Uh, and they try to be a little more practical. But as he went around and talked about uh, the Harajans, the Dalit, and how they should not be treated so badly, uh, and, and tried to put into practice uh, ahimsa, the, the nonviolent approach to life. Uh, that's what translated it into, into our culture. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to still remember we got some of our news at the Saturday afternoon matinee at the theater when they would roll a newsreel and show us films from around there. And there's Gandhi going along in his little doty <laughs> little loincloth, with his, you know, marching down the road to go make salt. <laughs> and so, <laughs> was, uh, uh, he, was, he, was, he was quite a striking figure. Uh, trying to get the Brits out of India and, and, and open, open discussions uh, in a different way. And, and, and one thing they have sort of done well several times is to rotate the prime minister position. The first prime minister after the new constitution was a Muslim. Uh, right now, he's a kind of a right-wing Hindu nationalist, mm -hmm. uh, Modi. But, uh, but they do, the last one was a Sikh. And uh, it's... Uh, they, they do recognize the diversity and, and sometimes are able to, to make little progress. Yeah. Mm. We're dealing with that all over the world, aren't we? We are, we are. <laughs> yes, good deal. All right, let's wrap it up, huh? Okay. For, Edwin, thanks Until so next much. time. Thank you, thank you. This is wonderful. Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> all right.